turn to chapter 15 in your little book. What are we what are we studying here? We're studying about what we believe and why. Why we believe it. Uh, everything. Chapter, you need some chapter 15. It may not be. There's 7 and 16. And it may not be. No more 15. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just carry one. What we believe and why. If you got your little old, uh, your little old chart with you, as we study this, a little chart that I gave you, Did you get one of them? You didn't get one of them? Yeah, I got some spare. I don't think we got any more 15s. I'm sorry. Here. Give that to your lovely wife. There you go. This little old chart that I give you. That was made, you've been here 25 years, haven't you? Yeah. This chart was made uh, probably five years before that. So this chart's old. Uh, I use this a bunch when I was teaching the kids back here. I had a big one. Like that. Robin made it. What we're studying here today really goes along with this chart. And I, I'm not real good at stuff like this. So what we're going to teach today, you might want to take this and enhance it, make it better. I encourage you to do that. Because every one of y'all are probably better at things like this than I am. But take the chart. Uh, run parallel with it. It's good. It's sound. It's biblical. And it puts things out there in perspective for you. Lots of times if I can see something like that, it makes my understanding easier than if I read it in, in uh, books here. Turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, we got through the first part of this last Sunday. So we're going to try to, we'll in review go through the first part lightly then we'll drop the plow on the second part and then we'll pick up the third part hopefully by the end of the class okay there in uh, God's threefold salvation one of the most common concepts of the Bible is that of salvation there's a family of words which stem from the verb to say that appears throughout the scriptures save, saved, salvation Understanding God's great salvation is a major breakthrough in studying the Bible. A proper grasp of the Bible use of salvation is key that will unlock many passages. Often when people see this truth, the big picture of the Bible suddenly falls into place and mysteries start clearing up, puzzling and difficult passages make sense. A good understanding of this truth will do as much, if not more, to enhance a person's overall understanding of the scriptures and any other single truth. It is central to the scriptures and every Christian should know it well. The infinite verb to save comes from the Greek word SOS, which according to Strong's Greek Dictionary of New Testament Words means to save, to deliver, or to protect. The word is not limited to religious use. While the word is used to express mighty Bible truths, it is also appropriately used in everyday situations. Anytime anyone is delivered from any given peril, it can be rightfully said that he was saved. A child can be saved from an onrushing car, a man can be saved from a lynch mob, or a soul can be saved from eternal damnation. 
The word saved is used throughout the scripture in three major senses. And this little chart I give you will reveal that. The Bible uses saved to speak of one's deliverance from eternal separation from God and damnation in hell. For many, this is the only use of the word that they understand. And for many, this is the only, the only way they use the word saved. However, the Bible often used saved to speak of one's deliverance from daily temptations and perils. Satan will ruin and wreck the daily lives and testimony of God's people, but God often offers deliverance or salvation. Furthermore, the word saved is used to speak of the day when God's people will be delivered from the presence of sin. That is, when you die. Now, to skip that next paragraph, it is important, and you can read it, but listen, for the sake of time, I must go on. Look at the bottom paragraph, all three primary senses in which salvation is used in the Bible appear in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I'm going to move over here and read that. Who delivered us from so great a wrath and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. There's all three of them. These verses speak of deliverance or salvation in the past tense who delivered us from such a great death. It also speaks of the present tense of salvation and doth deliver, those three words there. And finally, it speaks of the future deliverance or salvation in whom we trust that he will yet, yet deliver. Now, let's go to Roman numeral one, and we're going to break these down, past, present, and future, so it's easier to understand. The Bible speaks of salvation in the sense of deliverance from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is eternal separation from God. That's recorded in Romans 6. Those who have experienced salvation in this first sense have been delivered from the spiritual death penalty. Jesus Christ had to go to the cross and pay my sin debt. So I wouldn't have to pay my sin debt. There had to be a debt paid, and he paid it by his death. For all who have experienced it, this salvation is always past tense. When you're reading the word saved, salvation, always look and see which tense it is. Uh, Jesus spoke to a woman who believed in him and said, Thy faith hath saved thee. That's in uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 50. That's past tense. The scriptures speak of Jesus Christ who has saved us. Past tense. 2 Timothy verse 1. That's, he's talking about salvation from the uh, penalty of sin, which the penalty of sin uh, in Romans tells us the penalty of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God. When do we experience this salvation? There in item C. We experience this salvation at the point of belief, when we believe. And I always like to go back to this one because it is so easy to remember. I've used it with long, young people, and they understand. I've used it with old people. <coughs> Excuse me. When Paul and Silas were in jail, they were in the inner part of it. <coughs> Where they were jailed, the jailer was uh, employed under the rules. If you lose a prisoner, you serve his term. Er the Lord sent an earthquake. The doors opened. The chains come off. He looked in there, and he thought Paul and Silas were gone. He took a knife. I ain't going to do this. He was going to take his own life. He said, hey, dude, don't do that. We're still here. He came to him and says, what must I do to be saved? And right there, look in there. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Sometimes I think if God Almighty made it a little bit harder, maybe we'd be in our infinite mind, more apt to, to do it. But he made it so easy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. See there in John 3, verse 36, he said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's past tense. Now, this is very important, and I'm going to be hammering on this. Salvation in this sense was accomplished by Christ's death. He had to go to the cross and die. It was accomplished by his death. Now turn the page. He delivered us from death by becoming our substitute, our propitiation. 
He personally paid our death penalty. There in Romans 5 it says, But God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We don't deserve anything that God gave us. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, you, and hurriedly we'll go to item E. We, we studied this last Sunday. Uh, this salvation for us, he does in his office of good shepherd. And in this, this sense of the salvation, it is the saving grace. What's grace? Unmerited favor of God. It's the saving grace of God. And, and uh, Brother Lester was so good as to put you a little summary at the tail end of that part of it. it this kind of the prominent aspects of this salvation, it's always past tense. It's a finished, done deal. It's not progressive and it's not ongoing. It's a finished, done deal. It's from sin's penalty. It's experienced at the point of belief. It was accomplished by Christ's death, and he performed this as the good shepherd. And this is God's work of saving grace. Now, if you are a chart maker, right there's the good start. Now, let's go to, to Roman numeral 2, and we'll see the next sense of salvation when when you read the word saved or salvation in the Bible. The Bible speaks of salvation in the sense of deliverance from the power of sin. That's our everyday walk, our everyday walk. God sustains us as we go through our day. And brothers and sisters in Christ, if you don't think Satan isn't working overtime to make your life rough, he's running out of time and he's going to discredit you every way he can. He's going to make it tough on young people He's going to peer pressure them to death. He's going to make it tough on old people by having their families tore apart because that's the dearest thing to, a, to an older person. He's working overtime. God gives us a sustaining power to get from day to day. You see here, Paul surveyed the dangers of this. Satan always seeks to hurt and to ruin. That's what he's good at, to hurt people and, and ruin lives, seduce people. He works to ruin our testimony. He'll, he'll make you r ruin your testimony every chance he can. But what does God do? God seeks to save and to deliver from the perils of the flesh. And this is the salvation we're talking about here. Paul referred to salvation in this sense when he said, For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For sin shall not have dominion over you. And sin doesn't have to uh, have dominion over you. This here, uh, and you can easily see how if you take this out of context, out of the sense that it is, there would be a lot of confusion here because in this salvation, it is present tense and it is ongoing. It's a continuous thing. Praise God, it is ongoing. Every day I need, I need God helping me through the day. Every day, you need God helping you. Praise God that it is a pro, pro, uh, progressive, ongoing kind of salvation. But you see how people could take this and use that word saved as from the uh, penalty of sin and say, see there, you can lose your salvation. No, you can't. That goes back to the fellowship lesson and the relationship lesson that we just had. But let's go on here. Salvation here, this kind of salvation is from the present tense and it's progressive. You see there, and if you, if you, if you have a quiet place that you study, and I, you know what those little posty things are? Everybody use them this day. When I get a verse that really strikes home, I write it down and stick it up there. And I've got uh, this one here, and you would do well because in Psalms 46 it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. One thing that uh, I had read that in Psalms 46, a very present help in time of trouble, and Brother Earl brought a lesson, and he said, it's not always going to be this way. And boy, I got strength from that. Hallelujah, it's not always going to be this way. Praise God. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if it was always going to be like this? But it's not. 
Brothers and sisters, I don't know how you feel about it, but I believe we're in the last days. Yeah. What do you think? I think we're in the last day, maybe the last hours. Yeah. It's not always going to be this way, and God is going to be a very present help in time of our troubles. Now, I want you to see here in item C, and this is important, because in the other salvation we talked about, you had lost sinners that were saved from eternal separation. Now, in this salvation, it's only dealing with believers, and believers have to fulfill a criteria, and it's not hard. You see there in item C, it says only the believer whose life is submitted, only the believer whose life is submitted to the will of God can expect to experience this salvation. When a child, now under item C, and I hope you're following along with me, you see you have uh, number one and number two right there. Under number one, it says when a child of God yields himself, and I underline that, and then I went to number two. On the other hand, the believer who will stiffen himself against God's will. We got a believer, two different kinds of believers. They've accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. One's yielded to God's will, and one's just bowed up and stuck his heels in the ground and stiffened his neck. Now let's see what happens here concerning salvation here that we're talking about here. When a child of God yields him, yields himself to God and walks according to, to, true, to the truth, God will deliver or save him in this sense. It is in this sense that Paul spoke of salvation in Philippians. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye has always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation for fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, that means set apart, and meat ready for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. When we yield to God's will, then we are a vessel that God can use. There ain't no fried egg left on that plate. We are a vessel for the master's use and can be used by him. And that's what, that's what we're talking about, yielded to God's will. We're a vessel that can be used. Now, on the other hand, the believer who will stiffen himself against God's will and refuse to walk according to truth will find that he's not delivered or saved from the dangers which can rule his life. Now, I, I've heard Christians say this a thousand times, and I bet you have too. And you know they've accepted Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. And then they went on their merry little way. They didn't honor him with their presence. They didn't honor him with their tithes. They didn't honor him with their offerings. They didn't honor him in any way. They go to church twice a year whether they need to or not. And then something bad happens and they say, How can this be happening to me? How can this be happening to me? They stiffen their neck against God, and God, on his daily, his daily providing, here's this child, the prodigal son. The daddy turned him loose. He had to learn for himself. I want you to look right here, and this goes with my, with my devotion this morning. The last paragraph there on that page, I want you to listen to what Isaiah said in Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, it cannot save, neither his ear have, uh, heavy that it cannot hear. You need to underline this word, but your iniquities, it's not God's shortcomings, it's your shortcomings, have separated between you and your God, and your, underline that, sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when your prayers fall on the tip of your boots, don't blame God. How can God let this happen? Look and see what's between you and God, because God's always there. Always has been and always will be. There's something. What does it say? Your iniquities. What did God do when Jesus, his son, took on the sins of the world? 
if he'll turn his back on, the, on his only begotten son, what chance have we got when we, our iniquities come between him and us? That's something we need to realize and know. Our daily walk, our, our relationship is still there. He's my heavenly father. Now my iniquities, my sins have come between me and him. The fellowship has been broken, has been, has been hurt. Turn the page. This is important because a lot of people take this, this right here, and they, they askew it. You know what that is? They mess it up. They take this salvation and they, and they try to, they take this saddle and try to put it on the wrong horse over here. This ain't going to work. This is not salvation from the, the penalty of sin. It's from the power of sin. So can you lose it? We had a lesson on, on fellowship versus relationship. Can you lose this? Somebody tell me. Can you lose this salvation? Yeah. Yes, you can. Because you can lose your fellowship with God. You don't relate the relationship that was established through salvation from the penalty of sin is you still have that relationship, but that fellowship can be broken. Yes, I can lose this. You see how confusion can reign? When they try to put the wrong saddle on the wrong horse, it just don't work. Looky there, at the very top of that page, believers who lose their deliverance or salvation in this sin, if you can lose it, you can regain it. How do you do that? Through repentant confession to God. See there? In number one, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans 10, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You got to keep this straight or you're going to get confused. That's how people take this, the word saved, and they try to put a Shetland saddle on a big horse, and it don't work. It's wrong. Right here, salvation in this sense is accomplished by Christ living. You ever seen them old Buddha dolls? He's sitting there with his old pot belly, and, he, and he's dead as here's his news. My God is alive. Aren't you glad my God is alive? He was risen on that third day. He resides at the right hand of my Father, and he is alive. He's the well, and he knows me by my name, and he's taking care of me. And all i got to do is do according to his will. Okay, how do I know what his will is? There it is. There's a whole book full of it right there. Read it. It's important. Salvation in this sense is accomplished by Christ living. Salvation from the penalty of sin was accomplished by his dying. He had to die and pay the sin debt. Now that he paid that sin debt, the salvation that we're talking about here is because he lives. We even got some songs about that. If I knew how to sing, I'd sing one to you, but I don't know how, so we'll move on there. It is of his office there that's a great shepherd that Christ performed this deliverance. Salvation or deliverance in this sense can be described as a sustaining grace of God. He sustains you daily through your daily walk. It's the sustaining grace. And we're moving on. I see the preacher getting ready to cut me off here, but that's all right. It's in the present tense. It's now. When you read it in the Bible and it's present tense, it's talking about now. It is continuous and it is progressive. It goes on on a daily deal. It is from sin's power or its dominion over you. You can lose it, but you can regain it. It is accomplished because Christ lives. The other one was accomplished because Christ died. Christ performed this salvation as great shepherd. This is God's work of sustaining grace. The sustaining grace of God. Now, I'm going to leave it up to you. Do you want me to hurriedly go through number three, or you want to just 
hammer it next time we're here. Well, you want done. You're the class. I can do either one. Gary, what you want done? Go through it. Go through it. Hallelujah. Huh? All right. The Bible speaks of salvation. Hang on tight. Here we go. Number three. The Bible speaks of salvation in this sense here from the presence of sin. One day, believers shall be taken from the Lord. Praise God. That day, the death angel is going to visit all of us if he don't come back before. Salvation is in the future tense. We've been looking for this for how many years? Years upon years. Christ coming back. And one of these days he's going to come back. Believers shall be taken to be with the Lord. Salvation in this sense will be accomplished at Christ's return. When he comes back. And he's going to come back. Now I'm going to run something by you here real quick. And you just hang on. Because there are, there are churches in this state, in this county, and in this city that will hound on you. They say you Baptists are out in left field. The word rapture is not in the Bible. I'm going to read in your presence what the word rapture means. The word rapture means to enrapture or to transport the state of being transported, the act of transferring a person from one place to another, a snatching away. That's what rapture means. Now I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now this is when he comes back with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, if that's not transferring one place to another, I'll eat your hat. Hope you got a salty one. <laughs> you tell me what that is. If that's not rapture, there never was one. I read what rapture means. I read what the Bible says. Right there. We're going to be caught up and meet him in the air. That's transporting one guy from here, and personally, I'm looking forward to the day. Me and Brother Earl was talking about it. It's almost something to be envious. Every one of us has got a, a work to be done here on this earth, but it's almost envious to be with our Lord. And one of these days we are. We'll meet Him in the clouds. I can hardly wait. I won't need these. You won't need yours. Thank goodness. The heart medicine you take, you can leave that at home. Anything else you take, you can leave that home. You ain't going to need it. We're going to meet him in the clouds and be with him. Now I'm going to read one more and then I'm going to stop. Believers can only wait for this salvation to, to materialize. 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what... We shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, when he's coming back, we shall be like him. You ain't going to need them hearing aids. Ain't going to need them glasses. We're going to be like him. Looky here. For we shall be as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him, purify him even as he is pure. It says he's pure and we're going to be like him. That's going to be in the future. Future tense of salvation. Praise the Lord. Now we'll stop right there and, and take a short break. Let's have a...